so let's start. This is a fourth lecture on uh, literature and uh, history of mathematics and mathematics. And uh, Peter will chair this this session. Peter Kohlheimer. Thank you, Yao. Very pleased to be able to introduce our next speaker, Michael Friedman from Microsoft Station Q. His uh, work in fundamental topology culminating in the 1980s stands, I think, for me and many others as one of the most remarkable feats of theorem proving. We're very glad that he's going to talk to us today on a personal story of the four-dimensional Frankway conjecture. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Yao. I, I want to uh, thank Yao for two things. One, inviting me to give this talk, uh, which really brought back a lot of great memories. And also, um, you know, I have a 40-year debt <clears throat> to Yao. You know, I knew the 30-year-old Yao. Uh, we were together in San Diego, and uh, it was an amazing force. He still is, but uh, it opened my eyes. I learned uh, how to organize an army of graduate students, um, how to be ambitious uh, and generous and bold in mathematics. And uh, I, uh, I attribute that to Yao's teaching uh, long ago. So what I'll talk about today is the Poincaré conjecture, and I already put it up on my wall. Uh, I'll stand away, I hope you can read it. <clears throat> so I wrote it PCN, the Poincaré conjecture in N. For any dimension, there's a question, and it turns out to now to be a true fact. So the statement is that a homotopy N-sphere, I'll write it as sigma N, is actually homeomorphic to the standard sphere SN. Now, just for simplicity of exposition, let's always assume that the homotopy sphere we're talking about already has a smooth structure. Um, the theorem is actually true without that, but let's just keep things streamlined. It wouldn't be true, though, to say that the homotopy sphere is diffeomorphic to a standard sphere, because we have all know about the 28 exotic spheres in dimension 7 that Milner set, found. And, uh, the pattern persists in high dimensions. So even if you start with a smooth manifold homotopy to a sphere, the only thing you can expect is to prove it's homeomorphic. Now, for those of you who are not specialists in topology, a homotopy sphere is actually a very simple condition. It's a closed manifold, which is simply connected, and has the homology groups of the sphere. That's enough by the theorem of Whitehead. And homology groups of the sphere means there's just a homology group in dimension zero and a homology group in the top dimension, n, uh, z in both cases with integer coefficients. So the hypothesis is simple and the conclusion is simple. That's why it's a nice conjecture. So the theorem was proved in high dimensions, n greater than or equal to 5, by Smale in 1959. And the work I'm talking about today is uh, 19, from 1981 which extended Smale's result to dimension four. And then I should point out that another 23 years later, uh, Perlman finished the problem by proving the Poincaré conjecture in dimension three, completing a program of Hamilton's. So I should say that Perlman's work is completely different. It's in a different direction. It's Ricci flow and PDEs, whereas the four-dimensional case can be thought of as a technical um, solution to a problem that stops Smale in his original uh, proof 20-some uh, years earlier. So what I will need to do is uh, take you back and show you how Smale's proof worked in order to show you what happens in four dimensions. But before I get into that, start the details, let me just say philosophically that there are three streams involved, really, three streams of thought in the proof. Um, and I'll personify them by giving them each a name. One is Smale, which is um, differential topology and dynamical systems. The other is Andrew Casson, which is very special four-dimensional constructions. And then the other is um, 
under the name of Bob Edwards, which it re represents, Edwards represents what you might call the Texas School of Topology. And these three, three streams sort of flow together and, and give the proof. Now, sometimes this Texas School is called um, decomposition space theory or wild topology. It's the Moore Bing School. It's actually interesting, you know, 50 years ago, there were significant regional differences in mathematics. Uh, it's sort of like linguists talk about dialects developing and uh, new languages forming. And I think the modern world with all the jet travel until Corona put an end to that um, and the internet homogene uh, homogenized mathematics to some extent. You won't see regional differences. But when I was working on these things in the in 1980, um, there really was a type of topology done in Texas, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and uh, Bob Edwards was sort of the heavyweight champ. He had just proved the double suspension conjecture and the disjoint disk property. Uh, and even to say that there was a champ uh, shows you it's a little bit different flavor. No one would talk about the champ of algebraic geometry. Okay, so um, let's begin with the Smale um, uh, discussion. And what Smale did is he proved something much more general than the point break conjecture. He proved something called the H cobordism theorem. And let me show you what that is uh, in a picture. So suppose we have a manifold W of dimension n plus one that has two boundary components, call it M zero and M one. And suppose all the fundamental groups are trivial. Pi one of all three spaces is zero. And now one other condition that the um, relative homology of W rel M zero is trivial. So there's no relative homology, which means you can deformation retract W back to M zero. Then that's the hypothesis. Then the conclusion is that we're in the smooth category. The conclusion is in high dimensions for n uh, greater than or equal to five, the conclusion is that this manifold W is actually a product. There's sort of flow lines to, from top to bottom. So the conclusion is that W is diffeomorphic to M0 cross up the interval, also M1 cross the interval. And the, the way the proof works is the homology can be computed from the relative chains. And we can choose the relative chain complex to be Morse, the Morse cells. So these are the ascending and descending manifolds, well, actually the descending manifolds from a, a Morse function. And the fact that there's no homology means that the chain complex is contractible. And the chain complex contractible means that algebraically, there's nothing going on. It's algebraically trivial. You can cancel the chains. You can, the, it's, the chain complex is chain homotopy equivalent to an empty chain complex. complex. So it's algebraically trivial. And the big question is whether that implies that it's geometrically trivial. Can you really geometrically cancel the critical points and make the gradient flow become a product? Well, the simplest example of this cancellation, it's called the Morse cancellation lemma, is like this. Suppose you have a critical point of index zero. I drew it in dimension one. And now suppose you have a critical point of index one. And if they 
if their ascending and descending spheres meet transversely in one point, then anyone can see that they cancel, <laughs> at least in this pictorial dimension, that this picture can be pulled tight into this picture. And that's called the Morse lemma, Morse cancellation. But in order to do Morse cancellation, you really need to get the geometry right. You really need to make the descending sphere meet the ascending sphere in, in one point. And the information from the chain complex is not quite that specific. What the chain complex tells you is algebraically the ascending and descending sphere meeting a point, but it doesn't rule out the possibility that they really meet in three points with signs plus minus plus, for example. So as far as the algebra of the chain complex is concerned, a sphere, this is a picture now in the middle dimensional manifold. This is a picture in the n-dimensional manifold, this is like morally the cobordism. And in cross-section, you see an ascending sphere and a descending sphere meet. And these will be in dual dimensions. And the chain complex information will tell you that the intersection points should cancel. They algebraically are one. But in order to actually apply the geometric lemma, you have to remove these extraneous pairs. And the extraneous pairs in high dimension are removed by what's called the Whitney lemma or Whitney disk. You say, no matter how high or low the dimension you're in, there's a, a D2, a Whitney two-dimensional disk in the problem. That's because you have points that you want to remove, plus and a minus. You have an arc in the ascending sphere, an arc in the descending sphere. Those two arcs fit together to give you a circle and you fill in that circle with a disc and then you use the disc to guide an isotopy, which pushes the red off the black and leaves just a single intersection point. So this Whitney disc is a beautiful thing and it works very conveniently when Smale was in high dimensions and five or larger. But if you're in 4D, there are specific problems, that, new problems that arise. So I want to now start focusing on four dimensions. So that means this picture I've drawn for you is in a four-dimensional manifold. This ascending sphere is a two-sphere. And the red descending sphere from its critical point is another two-sphere. And in a four-manifold, of course, two spheres will meet generically in isolated points. The algebra will line them up in a way that algebraically they cancel to a single point. But now we have to find this Whitney disk. Well, there are various problems because of the dimensions. The Whitney disk um, might, in its interior, cross these two different spheres. It might cross itself because it's two-dimensional material. All these things are two-dimensional in four space, so they'll generically have point intersections. So this was the state of the art until Cassin arrived. So 1974, enter Andrew Cassin. And he introduced um, two things. I'll call the first one the finger move. And then a carlay of the figure move is what came to be known as the Cassin handle. So the finger move is a very simple idea. Uh, and let me introduce it to show you how it might be useful in solving a problem. It might be, because we're in dimension four, that this green Whitney disk in its interior meets a bit of the red sphere. So I'll draw that by just drawing a little arc of red here, 
kind of penetrating the disc. That could be a problem because if you do a push along the Whitney disc and there is that extra crossing, then the sphere, the red sphere will cease to be embedded as you do that isotopy. As you push the red sphere through, it'll intersect that other bit of red sphere. So Kasson's idea, and that's why it's called a finger move, is he just said, well, take your finger and just push it over like this. Just push the intersection point with the disc along over the boundary of the disc, and now it's gone, poof. It doesn't intersect the Whitney disc, but there's a price. Two intersection points will be created Two additional intersection points, a plus and a minus, will be created between the black and red spheres. So instead of having three points, we'll have, have, now we have five points of intersection. So it looks like we've made things worse instead of better. But it, it turns out uh, it's quite easy to calculate that these finger moves can be used to improve the fundamental group. Originally, this middle level is simply connected. And the complement, either the red or the black sphere is simply connected. But generically, the complement of both together is non-simply connected. But these finger moves solve that problem. They make the complement when you remove red ascending and descending still simply connected. And there's a quite a simple geometric argument, which I won't take the time to give you. But let me just give you an algebraic reason why it might be a good idea to do these finger moves to improve the fundamental group. The idea is that whenever two pieces of four-dimensional material cross in, uh, of two-dimensional material cross in four space, there's a little torus around that crossing point. It's called the Clifford torus. It's like the product of unit circles from the different complex factors in C2. And a torus, of course, has an abelian fundamental group. So it contains a relation that says the meridian and the longitude commute with each other. So if you do finger moves, you're stuffing all these relations into the fundamental group that weren't there before. So it's not surprising that after a while you may succeed in abelianizing it. And in this case, uh, it was a perfect group to begin with. So it becomes trivial when you abelianize it. So I think Andrew was the idea, the first person who had the idea that if you're thinking about surfaces in four manifolds, that you make the fundamental group simpler by making the immersion more complicated. So, now that very quickly led to the idea of a Kasson handle, which is a continuation of this uh, uh, idea. Because once you fix the fundamental group up, there's still a problem getting the Whitney disk embedded. Why should, how can you prevent it from crossing itself? Now, I think black shows up a little better than green. So I'll take this green Whitney disk, I'll draw it black here. Originally, it may have crossed itself in a couple points like that. So I'm dimensionally reducing. Instead of drawing a disk, I'm drawing it as an arc in the plane. But I, what you see here is that there are some <clears throat> loops in the image uh, associated with the double points. That's the important thing. The image is not simply connected. It has these loops. It doesn't look even homotopically like an embedded disk. Well. Because Kasson now had control of the fundamental group, he decided to go crazy and just do this over and over again. He said, well, we can do, we can add more loops if necessary to make the additional complement simply connected. And we can try to solve the problem of these double points. We can try to make it contractible by putting in Whitney disks to kill each uh, double point. But the same fate awaits the second level Whitney disks, which is they're not embedded. But Kasson was not timid, so he just went on. And he said, well, keep adding. And you get some kind of branching, growing structure, which he, he just took to infinity and took a tapered neighborhood. And he said, that's a Kasson handle, I'll abbreviate it CH. And this ungodly mass of spaghetti that that Kasson um, told us we should look at, he, he wasn't able to show that it was diffeomorphic to a two-handle, open two-handle. So that was the question. 
The question was whether, what's its relation to what I'll call an open two handle, H dot. And H dot in coordinates is a disk cross an open disk, comma, its boundary, boundary D2 cross open disk. So it's, it's a handle, uh, it's a regular two handle in dimension four, except made open by uh, sort of shaving off the boundary of the transverse factor. And what Casson's hope was, was that this was um, Diffio. And if it, if, it turned, if it had turned out to be diffeomorphic, that would have solved the problem because it would have been just as good as finding a, a Whitney disk. You could have used the core. But it turns out not to be diffeomorphic. Uh, what Casson was able to show is that it was proper homotopy equivalent. But that's not very useful for geometric instructions. That's Casson's work. But basically, the proof of the Poincaré conjecture I'm going to show you comes down to showing that the Casson handle is homeomorphic to the open handle. And that's the whole proof once you, once you uh, prove that. So th that's the sense in which I said at the beginning that the four-dimensional case is an elaboration of the Smale argument. It's not different in structure. It's just that there's a very important detail that um, is quite different in dimension four. But then when you zoom in and look at the work that's necessary for that detail, it's rather mammoth. So the detail becomes the whole proof. But that's, that's how it fits into the, um, into the grand scheme of things. So I had been working on Casson handles for about five years trying to understand them, you know, trying to complete Casson's program and show they were diffeomorphic. Homeomorphism hadn't entered my head. When in the fall of 1980, uh, my life was changed <laughs> by a, um, an after seminar pizza dinner at a pizza shack with several topologists in Southern California. Uh, where Bob Edwards held forth on a napkin a, with a pen and showed us, so this is 1980, fall of 1980. Edwards showed us what's called the uh, Andrews Rubin. Manifold factor. So I'll tell you what this is, and then I'll explain what it has to do with Casson handles. So first place, my estimate is that less than 1% of mathematicians, say people with a PhD in mathematics, know what a manifold factor is or have ever heard of it. Uh, now, if this was a in-person lecture, I would ask the audience for a show of hands. I can't do that, but it's, it's my bet that most people in the audience, even topologists, have not, are not conversant with this idea. It's an astonishing, and this is a bit of Texas topology. It's a sto an astonishing fact that there are topological spaces, even metric spaces, they're compact metric spaces, for example, that are not manifolds, they're not locally Euclidean but they have the property that if you cross them with the real line, they become locally Euclidean in one higher dimension. So it's not a manifold, but it's a factor of a manifold in the sense of you multiply by a manifold and it becomes a manifold. So amazing. So uh, let me show you the Andrews Rubin manifold factor. What it is, it's the solid torus, S1 cross D2, modulo a compactum called the Whitehead continuum, just to note it this way. So the best way to explain what the Whitehead continuum is, is to draw a picture of it. So here's the solid torus. And now imagine embedding inside the solid torus another solid torus, which has homological degree zero, but goes around twice in a sense. It's modeled 
on the uh, whitehead double of the core circle. And now this thing I called the whitehead, so call this um, the red thing, S1 cross D2 sub one. And what the whitehead continuum is, it's the infinite intersection I one to infinity of these solid tori going deeper and deeper in. So in at each stage, inside that stage, you embed another solid torus which goes around twice and clasps itself. So you reproduce this embedding deeper and deeper and deeper. You take a nested intersection of those closed sets and you get this compact, um, rather wild set. And if you crush it to a point, take the quotient topology, that's what this slash means, then it turns out that this is definitely not a manifold. But if you take its Cartesian product with the real line, it is homeomorphic to S1 cross D2 cross R. So I want to show you why this is true, or at least give you a good sense of it. And then I'll come back to why it's so important for the Poincaré conjecture. So in order to understand this, we need what's called the Bing shrinking criterion. Bing shrinking criterion. And what this tells you is if you have a map between metric spaces, X to Y, call it F, then this, the criterion says that F is approximable by homeomorphisms if and only if two things. Well, there exists an epsilon such that, sorry, um, if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a self homeomorphism of X. I'll call it H. So here's H. It's a map from X to itself, a homeomorphism from X to itself. Such that two things. One, um, the diameter of H applied to point preimages F inverse of little y is less than epsilon for all y. And second, that the distance between the original map F and uh, F following H is also less than epsilon. So let me help you understand this. So we have a map between spaces and we want to know when can we approximate it by a homeomorphism. So let's just think of the simplest example. Suppose our space X is a disk and the space Y is also a disk. They're homeomorphic, that's good. But suppose what the map F does is it collapses some sub disk to a point. It's the quotient map. You take this sub disk and send it to a point, every other point goes one to one. Now, this map, you can see, can be approximated to a homeomorphism because all you need to do is change the map a little bit so that instead of the image of this disk becoming a point, it's just resolved slightly to become a small subdisk here. That would be the approximation. So the 
criteria for when you can approximate, approximate maps by homeomorphism is that you should be able to find this self-homeomorphism H on the source, which shrinks, it's called a shrinking homeomorphism, which shrinks the offending set, the set that wasn't a point, the big set or the big sets that are non-point pre-images. It should make those sets, uh, that's the first criteria, become very small. And you can easily imagine a homeomorphism that um, of the disk here, which shrinks this disk, the subdisk, and makes it small. So one is okay. And the second says that these shrinking homeomorphisms, we're going to need to take a limit to get the final homeomorphism to prove the Bing shrinking criteria. So these Fs should not be, the, these shrinking Hs should not be all over the place. And that's this condition that um, in, as measured in the quotient, uh, F should be near the identity. H should be near the identity. <clears throat> so it's easy to prove this. Um, the brilliance is to think of it and formulate it. Uh, it's you know just point set topology, bare category theorem to, to prove the Bing shrinking criteria. Now, how is it used? How is the Bing shrinking criterion used to by Andrews and Rubin to show that? this quotient's a manifold factor. Let me just give you a little sense of that. Now, I only have one board here, and I don't want to erase the picture of the Whitehead continuum. So take a screenshot, or I hope you took notes, but here's the Bing shrinking criterion. If we can make the Whitehead continuum look small somehow, uh, we've done, uh, done our job, and we can we prove that the domain and range are, home, domain and range are homeomorphic. But by the way, I should say the main consequence of approximal by homeomorphisms is that Y is actually homeomorphic to X. Uh, it's sort of an extra uh, bit of information that there's an approximation. Okay, so if no one stops me, I'll erase the being shrinking criterion. Okay, so I want to draw a picture of the solid torus cross I for you, but I have to compress it dimensionally a bit. So here's the solid torus, if you don't mind. <laughs> and now I have the solid torus actually cross R. Well, it goes on forever. So I took the solid torus cross R. So this is S1 cross D2 cross R. And I want to draw inside it uh, the sub solid torus, the red solid torus here. And I, I'll just do that by a, a circle. That's, but it's act, actually the, at every level, there's a, a, a doubled solid torus. So there are circles at every level. But I want to somehow in this picture encode the existence of this clasp. So I'm just going to put a dot where the clasp is. This represents the fact that the red solid torus kind of comes around and clasps itself. Now the, the first step in their construction, okay, so first what do we need to do? We somehow need to make these red things get small. Because in, this, in the example I gave you previously, there was only one point image, that little sub black subdisk that I needed to make small. Now to apply the shrinking criterion, I have to make the entire continuum worth at each level of these whitehead continua somehow become small by doing a homeomorphism of this thing that looks like a cylinder, S1 cross D2 cross R. So the first step is to do sort of a sh vertical shift which makes the red solid torus spiral upward. So it, it links itself rather than, uh, uh, sorry, it links the next uh, one higher up rather than itself. You see, th this is the freedom we get with the extra dimension. In, 
three space, there's a clasp. In four space, well, you can undo a clasp. You can raise it up in the fourth dimension. But it doesn't, the clasp doesn't really go away. It means it clasps the solid torus at a higher level. So in a way, this just kind of pushes the problem to draw this um, spiral. But then the brilliant idea is to twist. If you just do a very vigorous twist on this sort of cylinder looking thing, then these spiral lines, if you twist hard enough, these spiral lines all become vertical. Right? It's the barber pole. You untwist the barber pole. And then these red subtori just become very small segments on these lines. The length of the segment is the amount of height that you raised the beginning re with respect to the end. So what we've done by this composition is we found the H in the Bing shrinking criteria, one of the H's. We found a homeomorphism that made even the first stage of this infinite intersection rather small in diameter. Now you have to repeat the process deeper and deeper in the nest with smaller and smaller vertical shifts in order to get the sequence of homeomorphisms uh, which do the job for every epsilon. But this is an example of the kind of geometric thinking that goes on in this field which used to be called Texas topology. And um, it showed that this space um, was a manifold factor. Okay, so. You've all been very patient uh, with my talk about manifold factors. I left off talking about Cassin handles. You must be wondering what in the world the manifold factors have to do with Cassin handles. So that is what I will explain now, maybe leaving the whitehead link picture up for a second. So as I said, I've been working on Cassin handles at this point for about five years on and off. And one of the things I've learned is that the Cassin handle is literally alive in the sense that it can reproduce. It can reproduce itself. Another way of saying this is six implies infinity. What I mean by this is if you have a Cassin handle of sufficiently large height, and in those days it was six, I think it's been refined to four now. If you have a Cassin handle, three, one, two, three, we don't have to go to infinity, we just have six stages. And I'm not drawing the branching possibility, but it could be branching. Then it turns out that just in this compact manifold, if you take a thickening of this, you can produce inside it, so call that a Cassin handle of kind of height six or Cassin tower of height six. You can produce in it a Cassin handle of height n for any n greater than six. So somehow you can produce a seven stage tower inside of six and an eight and a 10 and so million. And the, the proof of this, I won't take time to show you in detail, but it's more of this Cassin finger move technology. The idea is that, you know, finger moves are good for making fundamental group and or making fundamental groups simple. And if you do enough finger moves, it turns out low down in the tower, you can find immersed dual spheres to the stages of the uh, tower. So you can find S2s, they're self-intersecting, but dual, and then you can take the top stage and you can do a push where you push this double point down, down, down. And when it hits this, it bifurcates and becomes two double points. You keep pushing four, eight, 16. When you get here, the double points can be piped into, they can be joined to copies of this dual sphere. And what it does is it creates a new embedding of the six stage tower, but instead of the kink being at the top where the fundamental group is not killed, 
Instead, you have a billion kinks, but they're down here in the bulk of the handle where they're all these loops are trivial and fundamental group. And that's what enables you to add then a seventh stage because you produced a six stage tower inside the original one where the loops at the top are still trivial. So this is, was a combinatorial argument and it meant that in my mind that the handles were alive, they could, but the immediate consequence is geometric control. As soon as you have this reproduction, you can take various pieces of the handle and shrink them small, leaving six stages to produce more pieces later. So up till now, I've been drawing these handles, these Kazan handles, these, these extravagant things that just are, the higher stages are maybe just larger and larger. And um, there's no like orderly geometric convergence, but once you've gotten to this stage, inside any casting handle, you can find one with geometric control, meaning that it looks like this. Means that the successive stages become smaller and smaller. And now you can take a tapered regular neighborhood of the whole construction and you get a, you get a, the whole thing is compact now instead of non-compact. And you have like a nice attaching region at the bottom of the handle, sort of the lower boundary, which is an S1 cross D2. And then you have this weird frontier, which is the dual boundary. Well, I had already drawn pictures of this frontier using the Kirby calculus. And the frontier, call it FR minus, turned out to be this guy. So that, that was just the calculation. If you draw a convergent Cassin handle without branching, this, the frontier is exactly this wild topological space, which is in some cases not so different from the unwild space, which is just the solid torus. Now what gave, what gave me tremendous excitement when Bob showed me that this was a manifold factor was that I, I knew that there was hope to produce not just one frontier, but a Cantor set worth of frontiers. And I'll explain that in just a second, which is almost like a continuum of frontiers. And what Bob had just shown me was that if you had a continuum of these weird frontiers, all sort of like leaves in a foliation lying on top of each other, that it became a manifold. So the singularity, you see the reason that this frontier is disappointing that there's no Whitney disk available in the frontier is because the Whitney disk would be the transverse disk of the solid torus. And that Whitney disk is unavailable because you've quotiented out this red material which meets the disk in a Cantor set. So the pathology that's preventing you from finding the Whitney disk, according to Andrews Rubin, disappears if you can find a continuum of these frontiers all foliated next to each other. Now the picture is a little more complicated than I've drawn here because <clears throat> with even with geometric control, the Cassin handle um, doesn't limit really to a wild point. It limits to a wild Cantor set because this case, the simple case is when there's only one double point at each stage, but there might be many double points at each stage. So usually the limit is going to be a Cantor set, but it turns out that's no problem. If you, instead of having one solid torus at each level, as you go down this nest, you could have N solid tori or N I solid tori at the ith level, and the limit would be a Cantor set of, of uh, non-trivial decomposition elements. And the Andrews Rubin argument still works. That's still a manifold factor, that quotient. 
So this led to the construction, and now I think I'll erase everything, of kind of the key, um, the key object inside the casting handle, which allows its analysis. And somehow that got the name the design because it's like some Middle Eastern, like a Turkish uh, labyrinth or, or Iranian rug or something. It's, I'll just call it D for design. So what the design is, it's kind of a foliation Uh, a partial foliation by these things I call the four frontier minuses, these, these singular um, outer boundaries of cast and handles. So I won't try to draw a picture on the board of the design, uh, but the way you should imagine it, the way you should imagine it is a, a um, as you go out in a casting handle, there's all this branching. So that's like the fingers of my hand. But whenever you come to a branch at a stage where you add new layers, you get this branching construction growing. You can also make a choice and you can add just different disjoint singular disks to do the branches in a different way. So it's like you have two hands with two sets of branching going out. And the branching goes like, say, 10 steps. But then you can take the tips after 10 steps and you can decide to do another, you know, 10 steps on those. But again, they will branch in the direction, in one direction, like sort of the finger direction, which represents multiplicity of singular disks. But you can also choose just completely different singular disks, disjoint, which allow, well, I'm running out of hands but you allow the fingers to branch in two different directions, just like one, the branching associated with multiplicity of intersection is the fingers. And the second set is associated with different choices of those disks. You can produce, you can reproduce that and keep um, branching in both um, dimensions, if you like. And if you just focus on one growth, you're heading out, um, you're building this, uh, step by step, you're building this manifold factor. And if you go all the way to infinity, you do get the manifold factor, but you're not building just one because you have this parallel in a different dimension choice. So you're really building a cantor set worth of constructions, each of which limits to its own cantor set. And the union of all that material you build inside the Cassin handle is called the design. And the design uh, D has the marvelous property that not only is it inside the Cassin handle, but it's very explicit, a very explicit set. And you can also just embed it very easily inside the standard open handle. So it embeds, it embeds in the uh, standard handle and the Cassin handle. And I think of it as a topo map. It's like a map of the casting handle, but it doesn't fill up the entire casting handle. You know, in my mind, morally, I think it, well, it explores 90% of the casting handle. It's like your backpacker and you have this uh, topographic map that it has big splotches of ink on it or something. And you, you can't explore certain regions in between where these branches separated. And the missing part, the 10% that's missing is called the gap, the gaps. So that's like terra, terra incognita. That's where your map tells you nothing. And the question is, does this partial map of the Cassin handle, which also happens to be a partial map of the open handle, does it tell you enough to complete the proof, to somehow prove that the Cassin handle and the open handle are homeomorphic? And the answer is it does. And the idea is to divide out each side. On, on the Cassin handle side, 
the part that's not explored, that's the gaps. And I'll tell you what this means in a second. I have to put a plus here. I have to make the gaps a little larger. And on the handle side, the part that isn't filled by this map, I'll call that the holes instead of the gaps. Use an analogous word. And that also should get a plus, which I'll explain. So Well, actually, I, I shouldn't draw the diagram this way. What I should, yeah, so the, the point is going to be that there's a common quotient Q to both the open handle and the casting handle. So I guess the correct notation for this is this quotient map, which I'll call P2, is obtained by dividing out by the unexplored materials, obtained by dividing out the gaps plus. And this quotient map here, which I'll call P1, is obtained uh, by dividing out by the holes for plus. And the punchline uh, is that both P1 and P2 turn out to be approximable by homeomorphisms. And in this wild topology, that's usually the way you find a homeomorphism. You find that some decomposition map uh, uh, can be approximated by homeomorphism. But at, the, at this point, after we know they're approximable by homeomorphisms, the approximation aspect is not relevant to the final statement. The Cassin handle has a homeomorphism to the quotient space. And then the inverse of this homeomorphism, if I compose those two, I get a homeomorphism from the casting handle to the standard handle. And all these homeomorphisms, of course, are preserved the attaching region. So that, that's really the end of the proof to explain um, why these two maps are approximable by homeomorphisms. And the arguments are quite different. Um, so P1 approximable by homeomorphisms. This is the Edwards shrink. And it's, it's an explicit shrink. It's completely explicit. And it's very much in the spirit of the Andrews Rubin argument, which I showed you, but considerably more elaborate. It's really a state of the art of what an expert in this field can do. And you have, but the point is, when you embed the design into the standard handle, everything is completely explicit. You really know um, what you're looking at, and all you have to do is find these home self homeomorphisms, the H from the Bing shrinking criteria, the self homeomorphisms of the casting handle, to make the non point pre images get smaller and smaller. And if you understand this uh, subject, of decomposition maps well, uh, well enough in Edwards' hands, you can find this, this shrink. And that's in my original paper in Yao's Journal of Differential Geometry. This is, I think, section seven, the Edwards shrink. Now, P2 is a different matter because these gaps really are terra incognita. You don't know what they look like. So you can't use the um, shrinking machinery of the, the Bing shrinking uh, criteria to uh, reduce their size because you have no concrete picture of them at all, these gaps. So how do you shrink them? Well, by having, by having done this side first, by showing this is approximable by, by homeomorphisms, you learn a wonderful thing about the target space. You learn it's a manifold. Actually, you learn it's homeomorphic to this open handle, but all that we'll need for P2 is that this is a manifold. Now, it turns out that sometimes 
So this one is sometimes called the blindfold shrink. Because you don't really see what you're doing. All you really know is two things. This is what you know. You know that um, the quotient is a manifold. And you know that the number of things you have to shrink is countable. In other words, the number of, point, the number of gaps are countable. It's sometimes called countable null, but meaning they get smaller and smaller. There's a countable number, but only a finite number of diameter larger than any fixed epsilon. By the way, I never said what the plus sign meant, and I think I should tell you that now, is these gaps or holes, the gap, they have the, um, the shape of a solid torus. Well, a thickened one. They look like sort of an S1 cross um, D3. Uh, with some decomposition on the boundary. So their shape is that in this technical sense of shape, but they're, they're roughly, it's the homotopy type. The coarse homotopy type is like S1 cross D3. But in the world of shrinking, you really want to deal with things that are cell-like, that are morally contractible, not morally solid tori. So what you have to do is you should somehow bound a disc around the essential, you should kill the essential loop with a disc, and that's where the plus comes in. So it's possible to sort of backtrack and, if you like, spill additional ink on your map to make the places where you don't have a map, the holes or the gaps, uh, to make those a better topology, to make them cell-like instead of circle-like. And then you can apply this, this machinery to, to shrink them. So, uh, so what I want to do in the last uh, few minutes and then go to questions. In the last few minutes, I'd like to explain um, the blindfold shrinking argument. So I want to explain how uh, just knowing that the quotient is a manifold uh, is going to be enough to uh, uh, approximate the second projection by homeomorphisms. Okay, so I have to erase part of this. Let's erase this slide. So, um, so this, is, this last part is to show that P2 is approximable by homeomorphisms. So what, do, what does P2 look like? Let's just draw a picture of it. It's kind of drawn as a graph. Um, well, you know, just generically, it looks a lot like the Cantor function. That is, there'll be these flat spots. Near the, sort of near the uh, boundary, there's nothing exciting going on. It's just a nice homeomorphism. But there are these countable number of cells, sets that are bigger than points that are mapped to points in the quotient. So this is a graph. So here's the Cassin handle down here. And here's the, uh, the quotient, which we now know is a manifold over there. And, you know, you should think that, let me just draw underneath the axis since I'm reducing the dimensions quite violently, you know, four map. This is an eight dimensional picture here. It's the graph of a function from four to four dimensions. But let me try to draw sort of a diagram underneath this flat spot that corresponds to there being some set and then maybe there are other sets around it that are taken to points. And now over on this side, um, there's 
you know, some collection of, uh, you know, points. Let me put the cue over here. There's some collection of points that, you know, represent these uh, flat levels. Okay, so now our, the game is to, uh, well, in one dimension, this would be easy. Suppose you started with the Cantor function and you're asked to find a homeomorphism that approximated the Cantor function. Well, you could do it, you could just kind of wiggle it or something. And that would solve the problem, right? That would solve this problem of taking this decomposition map, which crushes these middle thirds to points and uncrush them, you know, produce a nice um, continuous monotone function approximating the Cantor function. And we have to do something like that uh, in this abstract context. So the idea is to work on the biggest flat spots and get rid of them. That is make them make the function monotone, make it homeomorphic in the neighborhood of the flat spots. And we'll see that when we do this, we create some damage. We create little vertical spots. So the basic strategy of the proof is going to be to pick an epsilon, take all the flat spots that have diameter, um, diameter uh, larger than that epsilon and resolve them. And the price will be that we'll create little, little vertical spots of size much larger, much smaller than epsilon. Then we'll take our, our graph and we'll flip it around and we'll do whatever we did to resolve the flat spots. We'll look at it from the other direction, from the y to x, and we'll resolve the ver large vertical spots, the largest vertical spots. And then we'll go back and resolve the next scale of flat spots using a smaller epsilon and we'll create even smaller vertical spots. And we'll go back and forth and take some kind of limit. So that's the, that's the overall strategy. And let me now give you a sense of how we exploit the fact that the uh, y-axis here, Q, is a manifold. So if we want to resolve this big flat spot here, that means we're going to have to make the function one-to-one -one in some neighborhood of it. And because these flat spots cluster on each other, we'll actually not be able to resolve a single flat spot uh, alone. We'll automatically resolve some small kind of companion islands. But how can we possibly do this? Well, if we, let's think backwards, reason backwards. If we succeed in resolving this and turning it into a homeomorphism, then there'll be kind of a photograph of this little diagram present on the y-axis near this level. So let's, let's do the resolution by embedding that photograph near this point. So this is the level point. So what we'll do is we'll take the entire open Cassin handle, which is just an R4, if we scrape off its boundary, we'll take this entire R4 and we'll use the fact that this is a manifold near this point to insert a copy of this entire picture scaled very near this point. So now I'm kind of drawing this picture reproduced in a, in a small neighborhood of this point. So what you should think here is, do you know those pictures like if the world that have Harvard Square is taking up like two thirds of the picture. And then, you know, MIT has this like little tiny bit and then California is like this tiny little smidgen and even smaller and the rest of the, so that's what you should think you're doing <clears throat> is the, this is like Harvard Square and uh, <clears throat> the rest of the world is squeezed in here. And now once this picture is drawn here, then it's quite obvious how to make the function one-to-one -one on this, in these red parentheses. Well, we just use the exact identification of this with that <laughs> to um, create a, um, a monotone function from here to there. <clears throat> now, something must go wrong somewhere. And what goes wrong is 
you have to taper this in to create a closed relation, you know, to retain some kind of continuity with the function as defined outside this region. And the way we do that is we take this R4 and we pull it into this very small ball. And we do this pull actually in the quotient topology where these points have been crushed, these sets have been crushed to points. But this push um, is what allows you to continuously taper this construction near the flat spot into the original function continuously. But what this push does is it occasionally will take an isolated point that's just a point and it will drag it into a decomposition element which is bigger than a point. And that will have the disturbing effect of sending this point, not to a point like a function does, but it will send it to the entire copy of that decomposition element in the y-axis, in the fiber here. So that means that when, while we started out with a function, when we play this game, we lose the fact that it's a function and we make these things that I referred to as vertical spots. That's places where it's become a relation. So it looks like maybe we've really screwed up because we started with a, a function. We were trying to make it a homeomorphism. And the first step of this infinite construction, we lost functionality. It became a relation. But it turns out it's not serious because by controlling these epsilons, you can make the amount by which it's not a, not a function. You can make the size of these vertical steps as small as you like. So then it's a rather routine limiting argument. You just take neighborhoods of these successive relations doing, as I said, the back, forth, back, forth, each time patiently sort of shaving off the biggest flat or vertical spots that you have at that stage of the construction. <clears throat> and at the end, you just take an infinite intersection of all these uh, neighborhoods of relations and argue that it has, <clears throat> its thickness is zero. The relation has thickness zero measured horizontally and thickness zero measured vertically in the limit. All the epsilons go to zero. And that's exactly what a homeomorphism is. Homeomorphism is a function that is a relation that when you graph it has zero thickness in, in both directions. So that's, um, that's sort of the denouement, that's the blindfold shrink. And with that, we have the homeomorphism of the Casson handle to the standard open handle. And then we can just plug it into Smale's proof and the Poincaré conjecture works now in dimension four with the caveat that even if everything started out C infinity, all conclusions which happen after the, these shrinking arguments, all conclusions are only in the topological category. So even if all the data was smooth to begin with, the Whitney disks you find and their thickenings are just have topological coordinates around them. So when you do the isotopies that Smale or Whitney would tell you to do, now they're all topologically flat isotopies instead of smooth. So um, this is irretrievable that you've lost this. And the amazing historical fact is that Donaldson came along within six months of this argument and proved, um, probably without intending to, maybe not even knowing this argument, he proved the necessity of using this Texas topology for this problem. He proved that there was no smooth construction of, um, no smooth way to trivialize H cobordisms. So I think I should stop here and I'd be happy to talk with anyone about questions. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, there's a couple of questions already in the chat. Um, there's the question and answer, the Q&A, as opposed to the chat, which I think is the preferred routine for adding, uh, adding to the discussion. But perhaps I can just read out the um, first question that popped up here from Andrew Nevodomsky. He's, he writes, you describe the proof of the Casson handle's homeomorphic to handle as, quote, mammoth-like. And he asks, historically, how long did it take for experts to review the proof and agree that there were no loopholes? And was there a specific part which... Um, oh, okay. Well, this is, this is sort of an interesting story. So, uh, you know, I, I said that Texas topology is kind of a contact sport, uh, like uh, heavyweight boxing or football. And uh, when uh, I thought the... Uh, 
proof, uh, you know, was there. I made an arrangement uh, to, with Andrew Casson to move to Austin, Texas, where it was the subject of this really wonderful week-long sem seminar. Bob Edwards came out with me to the seminar, and he actually gave the proof. He spoke on the proof of the P1 shrinking. Uh, I had the feeling when I was giving these lectures, my feet hurt, by the way. I'm a long distance runner, but this is the only time my feet have ever hurt. <laughs> Not running marathons, but giving um, 10 hours a day or eight hours a day of lecture <laughs> for a week. But I, I had the feeling that um, all the time I was speaking, there was someone in the audience who knew what I was saying better than I did. That all these topics that come in uh, are the um, subject you know, decades of investigation. And I was quite a, quite a neophyte and I had managed, you know, with Bob's oversight to piece a, a path through these, but um, there really was a very strong community uh, that understand the proof better than I did. People like Mike Starbird, Jim Cannon. Jim Cannon, I should actually say, uh, helped me formulate this blindfold shrinking argument in a, a way that was closer to the existing literature, closer to, Morton Brown's proof of the Schoenfleece theorem, which was easier for people to understand. So there was Frank Quinn and Rick Ansel and Mike Starbird. So there was really a lot of scrutiny at the, in Texas. And then I moved on to Princeton and gave a series of talks there. And this is this cultural difference. Um, Princeton was much more relaxed. They just sort of wanted to know the general idea. <laughs> Question from Greg Moore, just to clarify, where in the blindfold shrink is it important that Q is a manifold? And you emphasize oh, it. Oh, it's the chart. So yeah, so there's this point, like um, there's this, I, I focused in my picture on this largest flat spot, the, the one that we're gonna try to remove first. And um, the, there's a point in Q, which is where this flat spot goes under the decomposition map. So it's the function value at this height in the picture. And if Q was not a manifold, I wouldn't be able to implant this picture. See, it's the picture of the source shrunk down to a tiny neighborhood of Q. It's the picture of the source that allows you to resolve the flat spot. So it, you need the fact that this point has a manifold neighborhood so you can draw this uh, resolving picture near the point. And <clears throat> What is known about the class of spaces that are manifold factors? Is there a simpler structure to these in higher dimensions than lower? Or mm. is there anything uh, classification? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Um, uh, I think in many dimensions, it's known that, um, I, I, think in all in, I think in all cases, it's sufficient, oh, just a second. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, by, by the way, um, a very important theorem in this regard uh, is sort of the end point of this double suspension story. So, uh, I think in the late 70s, Bob Edwards proved that the double suspension of the Poincare homology sphere, uh, or maybe he used the Maser manifold, but one of those two spheres, homology spheres, he proved that that double suspension was S5. And that's really important and it gives examples of like non-PL triangulations of the five sphere and the recent resolution of the triangulation conjecture by, um, who, who was it? Uh, Monolescu, uh, Mon yeah. Uh, you know, it's all about, you know, that end of the world. And anyway, so Ed Edwards proved this specific sphere, its double suspension was S5. And then Jim Cannon, you know, in this kind of, uh, um, professional wrestling atmosphere, uh, one upped him, you know, and showed that the double suspension of every homology sphere uh, was uh, a, a sphere of two higher dimensions. And then Edwards came back and one upped him by proving the disjoint disk property, which is it characterizes exactly when um, a, a cell-like map, a cell-like quotient of a manifold uh, is itself a manifold. And it, the Criteria is that in the quotient space, um, if you have any two maps of disks, you can perturb them to be disjoint. 
See, that's easily true in a five manifold, but in the quotient of a five manifold, that's not clear. But Edward showed that that little bit of general position was exactly in dimensions five or higher, exactly what characterized the quotient as being a manifold. And now with Edward's theorem in hand, you can answer the question I was asked, which is, can you characterize manifold factors? So the first thing that follows from that is if something is a manifold factor, you don't have to cross with like a six manifold to make it become a manifold. It's sufficient to cross with R1 because you can use that extra coordinate to separate the disks. So it's an immediate consequence of, of Edwards' theorem. And now which quotients are, um, which quotients are manifold factors? Uh, I think Frank Quinn, um, yeah, in principle, Frank Quinn addresses this. Um, it, you know, there's something called the Quinn obstruction. Uh, he has a paper from the 80s uh, analyzing, uh, given a, a cell-like map uh, to a space. Sorry. Um, No, no, I think the direction that Quinn did, I think, is he constructed a resolution. So if he starts with a very general uh, space and asks when you can construct a resolution by a manifold, and then uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm stammering here a little bit, so I, I'm afraid I'm a little rusty on this. So I think the answer to the question is that I believe it's known by now uh, how to characterize manifold factors, but I can't quite uh, I can't quite master it at the moment. Another just audience question for clarification: You just having emphasized it's important that Q is a manifold. It's also important that the Casson handle is a manifold because you're going yes yes and forwards. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's kind of tautological that the Casson handle is a manifold because it's an open set within whatever manifold you were building. It's, yes. You know, Another question is what happened to the Texas School of Topology? The audience member <laughs> thinks it seems a lot more interesting than some other topology around, but. Um. <laughs> you know, um, it's funny, my encounter with it was uh, very brief actually, and I haven't, I haven't followed it too much. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think it exists and, and thrives. Uh, you know, it's funny, I was, um, I remember when I went to Princeton after Texas in this little trip I mentioned, um, I made a joke that it was uh, Texas's answer to Hironaka. And if you, you think about it, it, it is kind of, right? Because you can think of these uh, maps where you quotient out some collection of closed sets to points. You can think of that as a very general kind of singularity. And the whole question is, you know, when can you remove that singularity? You know, in, in this case, it's by approximating by homeomorphism. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I that that was a little bit of a a wink, right, at the sophistication of the of the Princeton audience, because to compare uh, this kind of mathematics to algebraic geometry, uh, you know, is uh, in intentionally outrageous. <laughs> but I think what it, you know, what I learned from this is um, mathematics. I think Thurston said it's a banyan tree. You know, it's this huge branching structure. And uh, parts that seem obscure uh, to you, what you should not sneer at because it's amazing, you know, how much good material is out there developed uh, in, way, in places that maybe physical, well, it used to be physical places, now it's intellectual places that are obscure to you and you don't know. But uh, uh, I mean, the, you know, the other passion in my life, which has been quantum computing, uh, evolved for me out of the combination of two completely different fields. You know, it was one Witten's analysis of the Jones polynomial in terms of uh, quantum field theory, and the other was this complexity work of uh, people like Jaeger uh, studying uh, how long it would take to simulate evaluations of the Jones polynomial, or approximate evaluations of the Jones polynomial. So. I've had many times in my mathematical life where 
um, subjects which are normally, can, well, from, from point of view, A, B is considered obscure and probably the other way around. So it's like different, different people's obscuranta can often be combined into something useful. Sam Nariman in the audience has the courage to ask about the smooth fundamental Frankly conjecture and whether Button Arby's work on the failure of Smale's conjecture in dimension four gives any evidence for or against. Mm. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Uh, yeah, by the way, we're up, we're due for something because 5981, uh, 2004, those were 23 year intervals. So by that logic, uh, Sam, <laughs> I'm very hopeful that by um, in 2027 we'll have an answer. <laughs> but now Watanabe's work, uh, you, you know, is about exotic diffeomorphisms of the, or families of diffeomorphisms, at least of the four sphere. And uh, logically, that doesn't really tell you much about smooth structures of the four sphere. What you might think is that would tell you that there's an exotic five sphere, right? By kind of gluing using one of, the, but it doesn't do that either. Uh, uh, there are no exotic five spheres. You know, there's a, a, a uh, it's an unstable phenomenon. Whatever Watanabe is finding in dimension four uh, is unstable to crossing with R. So I don't think that that changes the odds much, but I think the smooth Poincaré, four dimensional Poincaré conjecture you know, which is whether the sigma four uh, uh, smooth homotopy for, uh, four sphere is, a, is diffeomorphic to the four sphere. I think that's um, the great open problem. I mean, it's one of the great problems, maybe that in the Andrews Curtis conjecture in low dimensional topology. It's, it's hard to think of any problem uh, more important than that and more left behind by history. Following on from the question of how long did it take people to accept the argument, Bob Kirby is asking, isn't it true that Bob Edwards was convinced by our argument within two or three days of your lectures in San Diego? Yeah, of course, Bob knew more than I did. <laughs> he was convinced before I was, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the argument has been kind of obscure because my write-up wasn't too clear originally. I think the book with Frank Quinn is a little clearer. In 2013, I gave 10 lectures uh, by Skype uh, for, between UC uh, Santa Barbara, where I am now at Microsoft, and uh, the Max Planck in Bonn. So Peter Teichner is actually writing a book. I think it will be done this year. He, he and about five graduate students or postdocs um, attended the lectures and decided to write a book on the proof uh, to try to make this simplest and best exposition. Uh, when I was giving those lectures, uh, I noticed that it was 32 years uh, since the uh, proof in 1981. And uh, I was puzzled by how uh, clearly it all came back to me. It was much clearer in my head than the stuff I was working on that month, <laughs> which says something unfortunate, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take what I can get. So during the Bond lectures, I agreed I would do it again in another 32 years. So uh, that's coming up now in 25 years. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we could get through this COVID thing, we'll all be there. <laughs> Good. I think it might be time to um, to wrap up. I don't um, want to call things to an end prematurely, but um, I think we should thank um, Mike for a fantastic journey through history of mathematics um, of a sort that many of us uh, never knew. Um, well, thank you. I, I want to thank the audience. Uh, it's uh, a little bit of a taxing subject, and I appreciate uh, those who tuned in and uh, listened and got a sense of the proof. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's a very good talk. <laughs> and thank you, Yao, for 40 right. years of influence. Right. By the way, Yao, I'm working on PDEs right now. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> it took good me a too. long time, but now I am. <laughs> I, I finally see why you would like them. <laughs> I see. I see. Good.
Yeah, I hope to see you sometime soon. Absolutely. Harvard yeah, will be right. the first stop when I can get out of here. Yeah, great. Okay. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Yeah. Many thanks also from various people in the chat um, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for emceeing.